All right, will you please all take your seats? We're going to start. We are now in foundation, and you will see that the foundation, there will be a lot of the technical disciplines. So um, a lot of learning opportunities here. Um, with us today to go over survey is Logan Miles, and he is the Region 3 Survey Manager. Welcome, Logan. Thank you. So as she said, I'm the Region 3 Survey Manager. Um, I've been with ODOT for about three years. Um, and prior to that, I was in consulting for almost 17. So wide variety of experiences I've really enjoyed kind of learning about the new process. So um, I know it's after lunch. I'll try and keep it as interesting as possible before your food coma sets in. Um, kind of an overview. What does survey do for your project? Um, so we're involved in scoping all the way through post-construction, often even into operations. So once the project's initiated, we'll be one of the first groups to really hit the ground and one of the last groups to leave once the construction completes. So it's really important for us to really have an idea of the needs and scope of the project early. Um, kind of graphically to see that. There, there it is on the racetrack. We're, we're starting early and finishing pretty late, involved in most phases of the project um, from scoping to construction. So we'll kind of dig down in the details of each of the phases now. So scoping. Um, what we need is the purpose of the project, the limits of the project. What we provide is, is there, and so we're gonna we're going to provide any historic information right away, um, records to the scoping team, provide some risk assessments maybe to help you analyze your costs as far as what's the terrain of the site look like, do we know of some landowner issues out there, um, do we think it's going to be t particularly challenging, maybe there's all kinds of jurisdictions going on where we're dealing with tidal waters and railroads and, and things we know that are going to add some cost to the PE phase and potentially time, so we'll help with some of those risk assessments. And then we'll also provide available data um, in the form of either some point cloud mapping or um, pulling some older historic data to help with preliminary calculations and or alternative analysis, whatever the type of project it is. So project initiation, this, this is really where we get going on a project, and, and like with most tasks, survey is really a supporting role to your project team. Um, but particularly in this portion of the project, we don't really make a lot of decisions about um, what designers need and those things. We like the design team to really get involved. So we need, you know, primarily from your group, we need the scope, what you intend, what your purpose of the project is, so we can kind of determine at least our understanding of what that footprint might look like, and then we need to start talking with the design team about exactly what their needs are. Um, so it can be really difficult for us to get started without that information because a few different key pieces of information can change our level of effort fairly greatly, so, which is gonna impact your schedule and your budget. Um, so a good, a good example of that would be um, pavement design. That's information we need. We do very little work if it's gonna be a grind inlay. If we're gonna start changing the grade of the highway, when we're affecting rail and driveways and all these other things, well, then our effort's gonna go up substantially. So that kind of information is important for us to know as soon as we can in the project, so. Um, critical path item, obviously survey limits. I do wanna caveat that. I, I think I've seen it go both ways. We'll get requests to go survey the world because people are afraid to have us go back out there, right? That costs you more, and we'll get the opposite. We'll not get enough information and then we end up having to go back out there. And ultimately, that doesn't just affect this project schedule, it also affects whatever project schedule we just pulled off of to come back to this project. So I think, like anything, we can have checklists, we can have workflows, we can have all these charts and spreadsheets, but ultimately some communication is still required um, to dial in that, what is the appropriate level of effort? In an urban project like that, um, close to our office. We actually intentionally kind of kept the, the limits a little on the small side based on the designer's request. 
And then once they got more of their modeling done, there was a couple driveways that didn't catch. We had to go back out and get a little piece of information. If we'd have surveyed a vast amount, we'd have been in all those yards and houses and all these things, right? And so it's like, we really want to talk about that footprint at this stage of the project. That's the most important thing for us. Um, so some fatal flaws are that undefined scope, um, unexpected complications, add-ins. Add-ins can be big. We got a press job and all of a sudden we're, that was a grind inlay that's 14 miles of freeway. Now all of a sudden we're adding guardrail terminals to it. So survey crews got to go back out there, place control scattered out over 14 miles of highway and start surveying guardrail terminals. So when those things get added late to the project, that has a big impact on your schedule and your budget. So um, utilities are another one. Often they're in the, the travel lanes. So they require traffic control to get access to manholes, those kinds of things. So, um, and to be honest, because when we call locate tickets in, we're not digging, we don't get the response from the utility companies that, that an excavator will. Um, we, we struggle with making sure all the locates are, are put down. And frankly, return trips to projects, utilities are probably our number one thing that we're returning, at least in region three, that we're returning the projects for, because we just don't get the paint. And then we have to call them back and they say, oh, we'll go mark that and we end up, so we're never gonna avoid additional trips, but that's one of the, the big hangups. Um, so now into DAP, especially now, this is probably the most critical phase of the project under the new PDII directive. Um, a, a complete design footprint is more important than ever because one of the big changes is now maps and descriptions are to be done prior to our DAP complete, right? That's new. Um, sounds pretty simple on the surface. We're just sliding that back into a different phase of the project. But why that's really difficult um, to kind of come to grips with, and I think it's just gonna take a culture change and a little time to adjust to is, there's so much coordination that goes into that. The design team needs to have a complete design so we know what the footprint is early enough to give time for the right of way engineering function, which is nothing more than establishing the proposed fee acquisitions and easements for your project to be constructed within. So, but that, that takes a lot of people. That's not just the designer and the surveyor, that's the utility coordinator, that's the right of way agents. That's, we want construction, we want maintenance. They have to maintain this thing and operate this thing after we build it. So we have to talk to a lot of people about what their needs are and we can't even start doing that until we see a design that's complete enough to tell us what our footprint is. So that's a big one. Um, I know I'm working with project leaders in region three to kind of help um, change the culture about the importance of what we, we call a right away layout meeting and getting the team members engaged and involved in that, just like as if it's a design review meeting or any other meeting, because it's really the cornerstone of, of right away. And we all know once we get into the right away phase, that can definitely be a critical path for your project. So this works the foundation of that. The more uh, revisions we can avoid now, the less hangups you have moving through your project. So um, some other deliverables are, are survey control sheets and some um, DAP narrative information, some stuff like that. And obviously we do plan reviews and, and all of those things. Um, critical path, again, design footprint. I don't want to keep laboring that, but it's the number one reason we're going to tell you we can't do maps and descriptions because we don't know what to buy. We don't decide that. We just base that on what the design is. And we need the input from the designers to tell us things like maybe we see there's a wall going in here, but what we don't know is that they need another 50 feet of temporary easement to put the crane down there to build it, right? So we need that information. Um, it's a very collaborative effort. Um, access management's a big one I think that gets overlooked. Most regions have a sub-team of designers and the access management staff and the right-of-way agents. Region three survey is not always involved in that. I'm trying to fix that, but um, it's really critical because every addendum page that goes into the RITs that goes to the OTC expresses our desire for that property and what access rights changes we're making. So without that information finalized, we can't write descriptions, or at least we can't submit them until we have them. So it's kind of one I don't think a lot of people think about it that's tied to the description. And access rights are a big deal. People get pretty uptight about their access to the highway, so. Um, title reports are another 
potential source of delay. I mean, Curry, Curry, Curry County is a great example. There's one title company down there right now, and if we just hit them with a request for like 40 title reports, and they're telling us it's months to get them. So, um, kind of a challenge when you don't want to request too many title reports until no, you know what properties you're impacting, right? So you don't just want to go request them for the whole project because they're $400 a piece. And so it can get tricky. Um, so I think, I think the new requirements for having the maps and descriptions done in the DAP phase will be potentially one of the biggest adjustments we make. Um, but also I, I think it's going to be a place that it really does help with those revisions and scope and schedule going forward. If we can get it pinned down there, hopefully in the next phase of the project, we're not, we're not seeing as much revision. Landowners often request revisions. We don't have control over that through negotiations, but they typically don't disrupt the schedule like a design change or a, an error on our part would. So I kind of lumped preliminary through final together because most of surveys production work is going to be done by DAP. Um, we'll move kind of into a plan review role. Through this phase, we'll be staking at the request of the agents your proposed right-of-way locations out there on the ground for the appraisers. Um, doing any revisions that come up through the project, obviously. Again, those come from a number of different sources, whether it's the design team, um, the landowner, whatever those are, I don't think we'll ever get away from completely avoiding revisions to the right-of-way in projects, particularly complex ones. Um, because even something as simple as a change to the access language is considered a revision that goes back to the OTC. So, and that can have a pretty dramatic impact on a schedule. Like Jeff said, there's three months in there just to get them on the agenda, right, and to, in front of the OTC, so. Um, plan specs estimates and bid let. Again, kind of in a supporting role here but we do have some requirements to, uh, to do what we call our pre-construction survey right about bid let, sometimes between ps and &E and bid let, and that's simply a function of verifying the existing ground surface out there still matches what we modeled against, because most of the time in construction we're paying off those design models, and so we, the construction offices want to make sure that the, the existing ground surfaces still match what was there at the time we did the initial surveys, because often as we know, two or three years have gone by, by the time we get from project initiation to ps &E in a project. So we want to make sure we get out there and capture any changes to the ground so that the quantities and all those things in the big package can be current and updated. Um, we're going to provide any plan sheets necessary. We're going to provide um, support for utility relocation because it usually starts going on around preliminary plans. Um, and we're going to develop our handoff package for the construction office at that time that has all our control and surfaces and those things in it. So kind of pre-construction through construction closeout. I know this is a little bit outside of your guys' realm, but some of the things that we do that support your project all the way through the phase, um, we're going to provide support for the utility relocation staking, um, any construction support some regions have construction surveyors in their PM offices. Others do not. They rely on their tech center staff, so it does have an effect on you guys in some ways because there's some capacity there that we have to make sure we maintain in those regions that don't have project or construction surveyors. Um, so I think it's relevant to you guys as built um, verification. And then finally, uh, monumentation of any of the acquisitions for the project. And, and so once second note is issued, which is all bid items paid on the project, um, we have 180 days to go actually physically monument the property we acquired and file surveys with the respective county surveyor's office. So those dates are pretty important to us and pretty important for your closeout because that's a trigger to close out the project for FHWA. So, And then finally, we archive our data so that we can use it again in a scoping effort at some point in the future. Uh, additional survey tasks. Survey does a lot of things kind of behind the scenes that I don't think people realize, and in some ways they are directly related to your projects. And a great example of that would probably be 
the quarries or material source. We're constantly working with the material source people, updating surfaces, um, boreholes, those kinds of things. And, and, and obviously that's all in an effort to get ahead of a paver or something that is in the future becoming a STIP project. So um, we do a lot of that, landslide investigations, wetland mitigation sites, um, asset inventories, control surveys. So we're out there doing lots of things kind of in between the, the project workflow and project schedules to try and help set up the next project for various groups like material source or pavements or whoever has a need. Signs. Um, so some of our tools, um, I'll go through real quick, give you some time for questions. And I think this is important, and I know it's not directly related to project delivery, and I just wanted to go through it to kind of reinforce the idea that the more we know about a project early and what your scope and constraints are, this is how we determine which of these tools we select and what's really, and that's really gonna determine how efficient and cost effective we can be on your project. So um, robotic total stations, we use those for mapping, ground features, control, topo, all of those things typically in areas where we can't see the sky real good. So this is the most time consuming probably of all the data collection methods we have. Um, we use global positioning systems uh, when we can see the sky. Um, we're pretty fortunate in Oregon that, that ODOT's built us a really great continually operating GPS network to provide us the correct correctors we need. Um, we use these again to do topo control, monument ties, those kinds of things. This speeds us up quite a bit because we don't have strings attached to some, a total station sitting there. We can, we can kind of wander free with these devices. Um, terrestrial scanners, all the regions have their own scanners. Um, uses for these vertical clearances, buildings, bridges, underground utilities, curb ramps, landslides, you name it. We can get a really rich data set like that country store right there. That is actually a scan, not a photograph. So that, that's the data. Pretty cool. Um, the mobile scanner. Everybody knows what mobile scan data is, I think, today. Um, huge asset to the state. Fantastic tool. And we use it probably on every project we touch, at least in Region 3, for the most part. Um, whether that's just for doing sign inventories or some simple 2D mapping for traffic control plans. But the, the key to, to this data is that there seems to be a misconception that it's just ready to go, and, and often it's not. And that's, again, why are we going to be needing to provide 3D data? Because we need to just constrain this data to our control often to map from it in order for the construction plans to be correct. So while it's, it's, it's a great tool, it's not a silver bullet, there's still a fair amount of effort that needs to be ha you know, put into it to make that data valuable to your project. If it's something like 2D mapping for a grind inlay paper, well then we can probably use the data off the shelf. And that's why I say there's a big disparity in the amount of effort depending on whether we're gonna be out there constraining point clouds or not, and why we're wanting that information when you first kick off your project. Drones, everybody loves drones. Um, Geometronics provides most of the drone work for us in the regions, and we use these for a very, large number of things, probably many we haven't even thought of yet, and that goes, quarries are a big one, landslides are a big one. You know, they're another tool for us, just like the scanners, to keep people out of traffic. They're safety devices for us. We don't have to go out in, in the lanes anymore and survey. So it's, it's, these are great tools for us. Um, these don't work because most of our drones have cameras on them. They're not great in vegetated areas. So, but they're using them for all kinds of things, clear down to, flower studies and things because the imagery is so good on them. So they're doing some environmental studies with them. They're, we're mapping quarries with them, landslides. You know, we don't want to put, again, people up on a landslide necessarily. So great tools. We're doing some construction support with them. I know I've got crews out right now setting a bunch of targets on Roberts Mountain down in Region 3 and construction's using the drones to fly the big um, excavated hillside slopes and, and capture the quantities and to just do some grade verification against the, the design. So um, takes a lot of time out of the manual survey process. Uh, high resolution imagery, probably one of the most underutilized tools 
we don't think about it often. Again, we really need to know about it early. And so um, a great example would be utility locates. Call your locates, call your locates before we have the project flown. And now we've got a complete capture of the locates, pre-construction, we can do mapping from that. The construction offices tend to like this because they get landowners that claim we've made changes or something like that. Now see we've got documentation of the pre-site pre conditions. Um, so this imagery is, is really good. It's very high resolution and it's fairly inexpensive. And I know region one uses it a lot because it's so urban. Um, we don't in region three use it probably. It, you know, we'd, we'd have to do some exploration to see what size of project it really pays off on. But pretty much in, anybody that touches a project is wanting to see some kind of imagery. So I think there's some value to that. There's always Google Earth, but when you have it flown specifically, you can get higher resolutions and get things like paint put on the ground and capture that data. And finally, aerial LIDAR. Great tool. Um, Huskinaden Slide's a good example of where we use LIDAR data. Uh, great for capturing large surfaces, ground surfaces over a big geographic area, because the, the lasers will penetrate, penetrate vegetation down to the ground surface. So um, again, fully un, well, fairly inexpensive on the grand scheme of things. Um, so if we're, if we're looking for like a big reroute or something like that to a highway, this, this would be a great tool. So we just ask that we get as much information about what the needs of your project are early so we can make the decisions about which of these tools is gonna be the most appropriate. Some of them have some lead time, obviously. The, the aerial imagery and the aerial LIDAR data are contractor services, so that's, we, we, we just need to know what you need. So with that, does anybody have any questions? Comments? I couldn't have covered questions all. for Logan? Heckling, anything. <laughs> Justin, come yes, on. Yes, hang on for a minute. Let me. <laughs> Excuse me. So I'll ask, just because I've been getting a lot of requests lately, <clears throat> can yeah. you maybe touch on for everybody here the limitations of the mobile LIDAR? Because we've got a lot of yeah. thought processes lately where we can capture yeah. vegetation areas and there's not a lot of understanding as far as the limitations concerned and even contractors letting these guys know that they think that the mobile LIDAR is capturing way more than it actually is. Yeah, I can. So th two things. I tried to hit on the first one where I think there's a pretty big assumption that we just have this data and it's ready for us to just do whatever we want with and so there shouldn't be a whole lot of effort to get my mapping done, right? <coughs> not correct. Two. That's actually mobile mapper data of a highway right there. And so you can see, once we get out of the cut slopes and the ditches and the hard surfaces and into the vegetation, the data set gets really sparse. And the limitations on where the head's mounted to the vehicle, sometimes it doesn't see the deep cut ditches, the bottom of those ditches, or up the slope and, and, and get to the ground, because it's not, not like it's airborne coming straight down, right? And so that trajectory of the instrument can, can create shadows and things like that in it. And so um, it's a super good tool for, we like to use it primarily for a lot of overhead utilities, anything vertical in a project, and basically shoulder to shoulder, it's great. Outside of that, it starts becoming more difficult to count on the data. And it takes a lot more verification. And by the time you go out there to verify a slope or something out in the bushes, we still have to go do grade verification on all our surfaces. We call them confidence points. And so sometimes the return on investment just isn't there. We're, we're already out there on the ground, so we collect more points, more traditional ways. But those, uh, those shadows, in effect, you can see one. I don't know if there's one here. Is there a pointer on this? Right here. Because of that steep rail, guardrail there, the scanner did not capture any data there. Right? And so um, great tool, but not a silver bullet. So, thanks. Did I get it wrong? Any other questions for Logan? Okay. Logan, thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate your presentation.